It is a pleasure and an honor to introduce you to Clifford Hendel. He's a good friend and an excellent professional. Born and educated in the United States, but after 20 years in Spain, I believe that he is half Spanish, nearly. Um, admitted to practice in New York, England and Wales, Paris and Madrid. Mr. Hendel is therefore attorney, solicitor, avocat a la corte, and abogado. He has particular experience in international financial matters, international M&A and international joint ventures. In the area of commercial arbitration, he acts regularly as counsel or arbitrator before the ICC, the London Court of International Arbitration, the CAS, the BAT, and the Corte de Arbitraje de la Cámara de Comercio e Industria de Madrid. Rated as recommended individual in Chambers and Partners, the Legal 500, Best Lawyers in Spain, and Who's Who Legal. He's the founding partner of Handel IDR. Um, today's lecture, I believe there was a mistake before. Um, it's from Peckstein to Sering. Is the Court of Arbitration for Sport at risk, not a risk? As a cast arbitrator, I don't think he believes it's a risk, but let's see what he, he has to tell us today. Cliff, all yours. Thank you. Muchas gracias, señor. Thank you. Um, be, before I started, uh, and since I only recognize a handful of people in the room, I, I wanted to have an idea uh, of how many uh, of the people in attendance are lawyers. I'm not going to ask uh, particular questions of you, uh, just to, to calibrate uh, my presentation and, 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 and those that follow. Okay, can I have a show of hands? A good number, more than half. Okay, that's fine, because the topics this morning, my topic at least, is uh, rather legal, and, 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 and while there's not a lot of time, uh, to go into tremendous detail, it's, it's useful to know who I'm speaking to. Um, there we are. Yes, um, what I'm going to be talking about today are two cases, actually two series of cases, uh, which are not completely resolved yet, uh, which have received a lot of publicity, uh, and which, to some extent, uh, have uh, raised questions or focalized attention on uh, certain key aspects of the sports, the global sports arbitration system and the CAS itself. Uh, I don't know if you're able to read what I've attempted to present as, as an outline of my presentation, but in order to discuss these cases, uh, I need to give a little background. Uh, about, uh, well, about the CAS, about how it's structured, what it is, how it works, how it's special. Uh, I'd also like to mention uh, a kind of a global <coughs> context about uh, car uh, arbitration in general, outside mm -hmm. the world of sports, uh, particularly in the world of investment arbitration, because some of the currents of opposition, of concern, that impact arbitration outside the sporting world uh, obviously have their influence within the sporting world as well. Uh, and the ways that some of these issues are being addressed outside the sporting world uh, may have bearing, and there may be lessons to be learned on what could be done within the sporting world. Then I'll talk about uh, the, the two cases, uh, one involving a, a German um, speed skater, uh, Olympic, Olympic champion, another involving, uh, well, a third division um, Belgian football club and, uh, and an investment fund uh, which works with that club. And then I'll talk about uh, possible lessons uh, to be learned, uh, possible changes uh, in the function or structure of the CAS that might address some of the concerns raised by these cases, and come what may uh, in, in the final resolution of them. So starting with the CAS, uh, what is the CAS? The CAS, as you know, uh, claims to be, and probably is, the Supreme Court of Sports Law. It is an, an institution which is intended to be independent of any sports organization, uh, providing dispute resolution services, principally in the area of arbitration, and focusing on the sports world. That's the CAS. The CAS, um, and I'm sorry that this slide has so much information, but actually this is an example uh, of the maxim that uh, a page of history is worth a volume of logic. Uh, if we had a little more time, I would go through each of these steps, but, but, but to summarize, the CAS was created some 30 years ago. It, it was a, an appendage of the Inter International Olympic Committee. 
um, in the early 90s, a case went to the uh, Swiss uh, Supreme Court, the Swiss Federal Tribunal, and the Swiss Supreme Court uh, said, basically, this institution is too closely connected to the IOC in order to merit, in disputes involving the IOC, uh, treatment or recognition as an independent arbitral institution. And therefore, it needed to be restructured, reorganized, uh, which was done uh, in something called the Paris Agreement in 1994, which introduced a, a variety of, of technical changes, structural changes, which not entirely, but largely cut the, the umbilical cord, the relation between the International Olympic Committee and the CAS, which uh, the, the Swiss court confirmed a few years later was sufficient. From that point, in the mid-90s, uh, especially when FIFA uh, uh, put in its statutes a CAS arbitration clause, and a few years later, when the World Anti-Doping uh, uh, Code came into existence, also with a, a CAS clause, all of a sudden, CAS uh, took off in popularity. And after a very slow start in the 1980s, uh, by the 19, late 1990s, the CAS was a very busy institution, and nowadays has some 600 cases per year. Uh, and just to give you a, a, a comparison, by example, the, the, the ICC, the, the uh, International Chamber of Commerce, uh, has, uh, which is the leading commercial uh, uh, court uh, of arbitration in the world, has between eight and 900 cases a year. Now, of course, those cases may be uh, quite a bit larger and more complicated, but uh, the fact is, it, purely as a matter of numbers, the CAS has become one of the leading arbitral institutions in the world, and it has done this from scratch uh, in the past <coughs> a couple decades. So it's been very successful. Um, now, uh, what kind of cases do the CAS hear? Uh, and we'll come later to why this is important. Principally, the CAS hears appeals of decisions made by federations. That's the very large part of uh, the CAS's work. Uh, it, it also hears uh, strictly commercial disputes between two parties generally relating uh, to football, but the bulk of the CAS's work are appeals of decisions of federations and very often uh, based on arbitration clauses which are in those federations statutes and by which the athlete, uh, by virtue of his or her agreeing to participate in a competition, is bound. Uh, now, as I say, uh, in, in, in arbitration, one of the critical uh, and sensitive areas, and this, is, this goes beyond sports, of course, is uh, the consent. Uh, we all have, uh, from whatever jurisdiction uh, is home, we all have our, our rights uh, to go to court, um, our rights to be judged by a jury of our peers in some jurisdictions. Uh, uh, and the more uh, uh, civil matters, uh, 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 might, we might have less, lesser uh, protections than in criminal matters. But, but in general, arbitration is something which globally uh, the courts favor or tend to favor, but uh, they require evidence of consent. In the old days, many jurisdictions required that that consent be in writing, perhaps in a special clause rather than buried in a contract. In most jurisdictions, that has been flexibilized in recent years, but there is still some concern when, in the case of consumers, for example, uh, arbitration is imposed by a stronger party, for example, or in the case of sports, where uh, FIFA, for example, includes within its statutes uh, uh, an arbitration clause and that anyone who wants to play um, professional football or or, or, or participate in, in the Olympic movement in any respect as an athlete is required by virtue of uh, signing on to, um, to, to participate in the competition or in the league or in the profession, essentially to exercise their profession, uh, they are bound uh, by, this, by, by, by a consent clause. And, and, and this, uh, we'll come back to the point, but, but just to show you, here in the rules of um, the CAS, uh, we see that uh, that a, an, an arbitration, a specific arbitration agreement, of course, is sufficient to base a jurisdiction of the CAS, but so is uh, uh, a situation in which the statutes or regulations of the body 
in question uh, provide for caste arbitration. If, you've, if you are subject to that body and its rules, then uh, you are bound by the clause. That's, that's the, the caste uh, rule. Now, structure of the caste, briefly. It, it's, a, it's an unusual and, and hybrid structure. Um, and as I said, there was an attempt to cut the um umbilical cord, which connected the International Olympic Committee to the CAS back uh, some, some 20 years ago. Uh, the structure has evolved to some extent uh, since then, but essentially there is a supervisory body of 20 people uh, which supervises the CAS. And those people, uh, the interesting um, aspect is who are these people, where do they come from? Well, they are uh, described to be high-level jurists, uh, well acquainted with arbitration and sports law. Fair enough. But more specifically, the rule requires that four of them are selected by international federations, four by national Olympic committees, four by the International Olympic Committee, any by those first 12. Of those eight, four uh, uh, being chosen with a view to safeguarding the interest of athletes and four others intended to be independent of the bodies uh, designating the other members. This is an evolution from prior structure as to who these people were, but that's the way it stands now. And I think the, the, the only important point to, to keep in mind is that there is uh, a clear relation and uh, a relation in respect of a majority of the members between international federations and, uh, and, and these individuals who then supervise the CAS. And supervising the CAS means what? Well. Uh, they appoint uh, and remove uh, arbitrators to a closed list. Um, and they also uh, choose the uh, Secretary General, uh, of course, and the presidents of the divisions who have the responsibilities, uh, for example, uh, in, in, in issuing uh, interim orders. So uh, the, this ICAS, the supervisory body, is extremely important in the in the caste structure. It is what the, S the Swiss courts have determined is sufficient, sufficient to guarantee sufficient independence, so that this institution, the caste, can be recognized as sufficiently independent uh, from the federations in order to be treated as an independent uh, arbitral uh, institution. Um, that the Swiss courts have decided that it's sufficient, however, doesn't mean that it's perfect. We'll come back to this later. Um, an example uh, of uh, now some of the specificities of the CAS and how it works. I in red on this slide, uh, I've indicated that in these appeal cases, which are 90% of the caseload, uh, and differing from the way most arbitral institutions work, in the CAS, it's not the co-arbitrators, it's not the parties who then get together and name the chair. Uh, on the contrary, it is the CAS itself which names the chair. Uh, now, there are reasons. Or, or, or if it's a sole arbitrator, it's the CAS who, who names the sole arbitrator. There are reasons, there are good reasons for this practice in the sporting world and in the world of CAS. The principal reason being uh, a desire to have a certain constant uh, jurisprudence, as they say in, in Lausanne, a, a, a kind of a body of law which can develop in a way which is predictable uh, and which can give guarantees uh, to participants. And um, this motivates uh, or justifies, uh, or at least is used to motivate or justifies two of the principal distinguishing characteristics of the CAS, which is a closed list of arbitrators. Uh, you can't, as, as a lawyer, as a party, you can't choose anyone you want to be uh, your arbitrator. Uh, you can only choose someone from the closed list. That's point one. And point two, uh, as I said, unlike most uh, arbitration systems, uh, the, the two arbitrators pointed, appointed by the two parties cannot get together and decide on the identity of the chair, uh, whether from the closed list or not. Instead, it is the CAS who will make that choice. These are very CAS-specific features. Um, uh, as I say, motivated, justified by uh, the specific character of CAS, of the CAS and of its function.
Uh, I think I need some technical help because I'm not able to move the slide. Another feature of CAS structure or practice, procedure, similar to procedure of other institutions, is uh, the process of scrutiny of awards. Scrutiny of awards, for, for those who are not involved in, in arbitration, uh, is the review uh, of draft awards, draft decisions, by the institution itself. Um, the, the, the language that I've put in red is not unique to the CAS. I think it's almost identical to the language used in, for example, the ICC, uh, which, is, which says that uh, here in the case of the CAS, that the Secretary General uh, may make rectifications of pure form, which is to say correct typographical or numerical errors, but also may draw the attention of the panel to fundamental issues of principle. Well, that is, um, it's, a, it's a potentially broad uh, mandate. Uh, in the practice of the ICC, uh, that mandate uh, is carried out in a certain fashion in the, mand in the practice of the CAS, it's perhaps carried out in a slightly different fashion. Uh, but for the moment, all I wanted to do was to mention it uh, because we will come back to it as one of the possible um, issues which, which uh, people have, uh, uh, or one of the points of practice or procedure that people have taken issue with at the CAS and have been raised in the cases that we'll be talking about shortly. That, that was intended to be a short background of what the CAS is, what its structure is, and how some of its uh, practices and procedures differ from those of uh, uh, other arbitral institutions. Uh, I know it was very limited, but, but uh, that was part of the background I wanted to mention before getting into the meat of the discussion. Second part of the background is just to mention, um, and, and for the non-Spanish uh, readers in, in the room, this slide came from Ecuador uh, a couple of years ago. Ecuador was one of uh, a number of countries uh, across the world uh, which uh, was voicing uh, uh, vigorous and vociferous concerns about investment arbitration and, and, and in viewed the system of investment arbitration as a system in which uh, the big, uh, rich uh, multinationals from the big, rich, and developed countries uh, took advantage of the small fish uh, like Ecuador. And uh, this led to uh, a number of countries revoking or rescinding their bilateral investment um, treaties. It led to uh, discussions and concerns in uh, Europe and in Brussels. Uh, and in fact, uh, has led to a revisiting of the entire uh, investment uh, arbitration system, uh, which, uh, for example, is currently uh, undergoing uh, an amendment of uh, the rules and regulations from, from ICSID, from the World Bank, which is the principal institution uh, administering this kind of claim. Uh, ICSID has proposed uh, in, in a three-volume set in Spanish, English, and French, updates of its rules. They've posted them on, on the web. They're having uh, hearings. They're, 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 they're doing road shows. This is a long public process in which they are, uh, in which they are sharing with uh, the people that they consider their stakeholders, the, the, the member states of the World Bank, of the exit system, uh, and, and, and parties who are potential uh, uh, claimants or investors as well. Um, it's an open, uh, ongoing, very public process to deal with uh, or address concerns which have been raised over the past several years. Um, and I say nothing further about it, but it, it's something to, to keep an eye on uh, because it affects not only uh, how investment arbitration is conducted, but it will also affect how commercial uh, arbitration, how sports arbitration, how consumer arbitration is conducted and is viewed because many of the concerns, many of the objections, many of the issues that are raised uh, uh, apply across all of these areas. Uh, they're not limited to one. And what I'm trying to do 
in this discussion, in, in this presentation, is to, is to give background to you uh, from the world outside. Uh, of sports before focusing in on the world of sports to, to, to sort of drill down on the point that there are uh, there are commonalities there are, that we are we are responding we are seeing similar concerns in different areas of, of the law different areas of practice uh, and if we step back and we look a little bit globally or comparatively we can understand better what the issues are and perhaps we can understand better what the solutions might be F the final preliminary uh, uh, mention that I wanted to make is uh, something of, uh, of one of the local uh, um, entities uh, involved in arbitration called the Club Español de Arbitraje, which uh, under the presidency of a very uh, active uh, and a very forward-looking uh, Spanish lawyer named uh, Juan Fernández Armesto is uh, creating or revising a, a code of, uh, of, of good practices or best practices in arbitration. And, and the purpose of this uh, is uh, because, in Juan's view, uh, arbitration is under attack. Now, it's under attack principally uh, in the investment arena, but it's under attack in the commercial arena as well. It's under attack in the sports arena as well, which, we're, which is what we're coming to. Uh, and, um, and if we don't uh, take proactive measures, if we don't uh, take steps to improve the perception to augment the legitimacy or the perception of legitimacy of the system, then uh, we are at risk. We being people, parties, lawyers, arbitrators who work uh, in the world of private resolution of disputes. And, and uh, the Club Español de Arbitraje, as a result, has an ongoing um, uh, project uh, in hand to create what might be on a global basis. Uh, a rather innovative uh, uh, code of, of good practices, of best practices, precisely for the purpose of being ahead of the game uh, in order to uh, defeat uh, concerns of, about the legitimacy of arbitration and to increase uh, uh, expectations and understandings of its, of its legitimacy. Now, that was quick background. Uh, the two cases. Uh, the first case is uh, Claudia Pechstein. Uh, there you see her. She is a uh, German speed skater, uh, apparently uh, the most highly decorated um, speed skater ever. I think she won nine uh, Olympic gold medals, participated in four Olympic Games. Uh, she, she was uh, a myth in, uh, in Germany uh, for, for many years. Um, she is uh, also a very tenacious uh, litigant. Um, she got in trouble in 2009 when she was accused uh, on the basis of, of test results of having uh, an abnormally high uh, percentage of, a, of something in her red blood cells, the only explanations for which were uh, blood doping, which is practices to, to increase uh, uh, th your percentage of blood cells, which increases your, your, your oxygen storing capacity, which increases your, your, your ability, your speed, uh, or uh, a, a, congenital, a congenital family disease. Th those are the only two explanations. Couldn't be, couldn't be a coincidence. Um, the ISU, uh, the International Skating Union, um, looked at her case. Uh, and uh, sanctioned her with two years of, of um, ineligibility uh, for blood doping. She did what, um, what is appropriate to do, what, what is understandable, which is to take that uh, adverse decision of the Federation to the CAS. As I mentioned before, the CAS is there to hear appeals from uh, federations. She went to the CAS. Uh, she signed a procedural order, which is typical um, CAS uh, practice. It's, it's similar to a, uh, a terms of reference in an ICC arbitration, but it basically sets out uh, the jurisdiction, the parties, the claim, uh, etc. Uh, she signed that without any objection. Um, and, uh, and she proceeded with her case. At her case, she uh, had wanted 
the, the case was held in the, the CAS uh, facility in Lausanne. It's a small building with a small hearing room. Uh, she wanted her agent uh, to be able to sit in uh, at the hearings. Uh, the CAS tribunal, uh, who had no requirement under the CAS rules to, to, to hold a public hearing, but decided not to let the agent sit in. She objected to that. But um, basically, that, that, was, that was the essence uh, of the proceeding, and the CAS uh, confirmed the two-year sanction. Uh, she had tried to introduce some exculpatory evidence, because she was beginning to develop evidence that maybe there was uh, a, a family congenital uh, disease uh, at issue here, and that this was, as a result, not uh, blood doping, or at least there, were, there, there could be substantial doubt as to what it was. But the CAS rejected uh, that evidence on the ground, uh, essentially, that uh, no, you could have presented this. You could and should have presented this before, and to the International Skating Union, you didn't, so we don't want to hear it here. Now, that may have been rather strict, but, but that was the decision. She then did uh, what is also appropriate, which is to say, go to the Swiss courts to seek an annulment of that uh, CAS award. Uh, and the result was similar. Uh, to what it is in the vast majority of cases in which that path is taken, which is to say the annulment action was rejected. Um, uh, in her, but, but what was interesting was that in her uh, submissions to the Swiss Federal Tribunal, she now began to raise some issues uh, that she hadn't raised previously and that were very interesting. One was the lack of independence and impartiality of the CAS itself. The Swiss Federal Tribunal didn't want to hear it. Uh, it hadn't been raised uh, in the CAS proceeding. And, um, well, some years before, the Swiss Federal Tribunal had already concluded that the CAS was sufficiently uh, impartial and independent, as I mentioned. Uh, another argument that she raised uh, stressed the question of the public hearing. That she, she felt that she was entitled uh, to a public public hearing and that that requirement, which exists under the uh, European Court of Human Rights, we'll talk about that in a few moments, that that should apply to arbitral proceedings as well as to court proceedings. Um, the Swiss Federal Court rejected that argument as well. What's interesting, and, and, and I say that she is a very tenacious litigant, what's interesting about Claudia Pechstein and, and her team of lawyers is that they didn't stop there. They, they didn't stop after having lost at the CAS and after having lost at the Swiss Federal Tribunal. Uh, on the contrary, they continued. They brought two further actions. One was a proceeding uh, uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, this proceeding uh, basically, basically uh, uh, repeats arguments that she's made in the German courts, so, um, so I won't repeat them for, uh, uh, in order to, to, to keep things moving. Uh, but I would mention, and what's important, is that the case before the European Court of Human Rights is still pending. It was filed, I think, in 2010 or 2011. It has been moving at a snail's pace, and it has not been resolved. So that case is still out there. The rest of, of the Claudia Pechstein story takes place in Germany and has been fascinating, uh, high visibility, uh, quite unpredictable, uh, it has been uh, a case of, uh, well, kind of a ping-pong effect where at the three levels of the German courts, the trial level, the appeals level, and the Supreme Court level, uh, you know, very different decisions have come out. And uh, there is one level left, which is the German Constitutional Court. She has, uh, just to, to, um, to, to accelerate a bit, then we'll go back to the, the three principal courts, she has pending before the German Constitutional Court a, 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 an appeal uh, of, of the German Supreme Court uh, decision, which was adverse to her, as, as we'll mention shortly. Uh, the German Constitutional Court, so far as I know, has not yet decided, they're not obligated to hear the case. Uh, they, they will hear it if they choose to hear it. Uh, as far as I know, they have not yet decided if they are going to actually hear it. And if and when they do decide to hear it, it will then need to be briefed. There might be a hearing. So that German constitutional court decision, uh, or possible decision, is still a year or two down the road, at least. The European Court of Human Rights decision uh, is, a, is, is a mystery, because no one knows how long that will take. But let us just uh, leave those on the side, because there's nothing more to say about them, and go quickly to the three German 
courts uh, and their, their decisions. She started uh, with a claim for damages against the International Skating Union and the German Skating Union. Uh, the, the German lower court issued uh, uh, a, a, a judgment that was of great concern to the sporting community because uh, what it did was to say, well, uh, you, Claudia Pechstein, were forced by the monopolistic body, the International Skating Union, to agree to arbitrate disputes before the CAS. This was not, uh, you had no choice but to sign. If you wanted to exercise your profession, if you wanted to work as a skater, to work seriously as a skater, to, 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 to compete in s serious competitions, you had no choice but to sign, uh, to sign on uh, to the uh, CAS arbitration clause. Uh, the, the ISU is, is a monopoly, uh, you, and, and, and this, this, this is a structural imbalance which renders invalid your consent. Your consent was not a real consent. But, said the German court, since you didn't raise this previously, since the matter has been decided already in Switzerland by the CAS, uh, and you had the opportunity to go to the Swiss courts to annul that decision, and you did, we are bound for reasons of res judicata, uh, not to uh, uh, not to go into uh, the argument, but but they observed they observed that the that the forced consent, what they could consider the forced consent, was invalid. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, this forced consent is an issue in the sporting world. It's an issue in the world of uh, consumer arbitration as well. Uh, but it it it. Is, is one of the foundations or one of the building blocks on which sports arbitration and CAS uh, arbitration works. So when a court in a jurisdiction like Germany says that that uh, doesn't work, that that is not evidence of real consent, that, that is a concern. The matter was appealed. Uh, the appeal court in Germany came to a slightly different, uh, uh, perhaps a more sophisticated uh, uh, conclusion, which was that the clause is not invalid per se, but the clause was invalid because uh, the CAS itself is structurally imbalanced and by pushing or requiring that Claudia Pechstein, in order to be a skater and to exercise her profession, sign on to a CAS arbitration clause that, um, that she su submit herself to arbitration before the CAS that the CAS was too close to the federations, its structure was too imbalanced to be respected as independent and impartial, and therefore uh, the ISU's imposition on Claudia Pechstein of a CAS arbitration clause was the abuse of a dominant position in, in terms of competition law, of antitrust law, and therefore was in violation of German public policy and of the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Agreements. This was uh, a, an earthquake in the world of sports arbitration because now we have a, a, a German appellate court uh, uh, saying, basically disagreeing with the Swedish court, uh, the Swiss courts, forgive me, and saying that the caste is structurally imbalanced. The caste is not fair. The caste uh, uh, system, the CAS structure, the CAS procedures are not sufficiently um, balanced uh, between interests uh, of athletes and interests of federations in order for it to, to be treated as if it were an independent institution. This case then goes to the German Supreme Court. And uh, there the CAS, uh, uh, well, there, there the appeals court decision is reversed and a decision comes out which is <coughs> entirely favorable to the existing caste structure, similar to the Swiss uh, uh, decisions, uh, and says, uh, basically confirms that the caste is indeed sufficiently independent and in impartial to be a, a genuine arbitral institution, to be uh, entitled to be recognized as such. It is not structurally imbalanced uh, that the consent of Claudia Pechstein was voluntary, uh, it wasn't uh, physically coerced, after all, the court mentioned, um, that uh, in the context of Claudia Pechstein's case, doping 
there was a clear commonality of interest, they said, between uh, sta all stakeholders in, in the sporting world, athletes, federations, etc., uh, in order to keep international sports free of doping, uh, and essentially that there were sufficient guarantees in the CAS structure and procedures and rules to protect the rights of athletes. This not, notwithstanding that there is a closed list, that appointments um, uh, to the list are made by the ICAS, notwithstanding that the ICAS has a certain relation with the federations, perhaps more than it does with, with athletes, uh, etc. The decision has been criticized. Uh, there might be elements of the decision which one could consider political, perhaps, maybe not entirely satisfactory. But uh, this is the German Supreme, uh, Supreme Court, uh, unless the German Constitutional Court uh, gets involved, and my expectation would be that it will not, then this is the end of the story uh, in Germany. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, there is a case pending before the European Court of, of Human Rights, uh, basically uh, addressing the same arguments, the lack of independence and impartiality of the CAS, uh, the undue influence of the International Olympic Committee and other federations in the structure and operations of the CAS and, and, and the designation of the Secretary General, uh, the absence of a public hearing. Uh, but, but here, uh, the claims are simply based on a different instrument, um, the, the, the European uh, Charter of Human Rights, and, and which, does, which do guarantee certain procedural rights and legal proceedings. And the question is, uh, are these proceedings of an arbitral institution or of a particular arbitra arbitral institution um, to be considered the civil proceedings uh, for purposes of the European uh, Council, uh, Charter on, on, on Human Rights. If so, there is a possibility that Claudia Beckstein's case will come back uh, to the, the, the front pages. I would tend to doubt it. But that, that in, 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 in a very short overview, is, is a, summary, a summary of, of a legal saga which is extremely complicated and um, uh, and not finished. Yeah. Uh, the CAS, uh, which lived with the threat of the two lower court decisions for, for about a year, uh, I think they waited about 24 hours uh, after the Supreme Court decision, and then they issued a, a press release uh, uh, indicating, of course, that they were very happy with the result and that the German courts had now confirmed, uh, as the Swiss courts uh, had previously done, that uh, the CAS uh, is, uh, is sufficiently uh, independent to, to be treated as a, an independent arbitral tribunal. And the, the last sentence uh, is something that I wanted to mention, which, which was uh, a mention that um, uh, while they're very happy with the decision, of course, the CAS will continue to listen and analyze the requests and suggestions of its users, as well as of judges and legal experts, in order to continue its development to improve and evolve the changes in international sport and best practices in international arbitration law with appropriate reforms. Okay, uh, enough for <laughs> Pechstein. Uh, we turn to the second case. Uh, I mentioned that this is the case of a third division football club in Brussels called uh, Serang. Uh, the, the photo is not of the club, the, the, these are uh, one of their junior uh, uh, clubs, uh, I think, but, but this is a very minor club. Uh, what's interesting is they have entered into uh, financing arrangements with uh, one of the leading uh, funders of of uh, football players uh, in and their transfers in the world called Doyen uh, in a practice which is referred to as uh, TPO, uh, third party ownership. Uh, third party ownership is, uh, perhaps was, uh, a very controversial uh, and very complicated system in which, or by which, clubs uh, from, and particularly from uh, football exporting uh, countries, Latin America in particular, uh, financed uh, their operations by selling uh, portions of the uh, economic rights or the economic upside to uh, football players um, uh, such that in the event of a future transfer of the player, uh, the investor would receive a portion of that upside. This practice was 
uh, accepted in many jurisdictions, uh, many leagues, Spanish leagues, Portuguese league, uh, use the practice uh, sufficient, uh, often. Uh, and, uh, but it raised, it raised issues. Uh, TPO is a very complex issue. It raises issue about the integrity of, of the game. It, 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 it raises questions about contractual stability. Uh, FIFA began to study the question very closely. It's an issue which is very hard to regulate, and FIFA ultimately decided to be more radical and to simply prohibit it. And since 2015, I think, uh, TPO is now prohibited. Uh, but as I said, <coughs> extremely complicated and controversial issue, and, it, and an issue in which many leagues, many clubs, uh, many countries uh, would have come out on one side, whereas uh, many clubs, many leagues, many countries would have come out on another. Uh, FIFA decided to, be, to take a radical um, step and prohibit the practice altogether, and that has given rise to legal challenges. Serang is simply a vehicle for that uh, challenge. Could have been any other club. But Doyen entered into an agreement with uh, 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 Serang uh, uh, for a few players, uh, and uh, FIFA uh, became aware of that agreement. It was patently in violation of the TPO rules. FIFA sanctioned the club. FIFA can't sanction the, the investment fund. They sanctioned the club. Uh, two or three years, I think, of, 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 no, of no transfers and a monetary fine as well. What did the club do? The club, uh, the club did what it should do. It went to the CAS. What happened at the CAS? They lost. Uh, they argued uh, uh, that, that the FIFA prohibition was uh, uh, inconsistent with European competition law. Uh, but the CAS panel, a very distinguished panel and a very uh, solid award, came to the conclusion that uh, no, uh, uh, FIFA had a, a legitimate objective in uh, banning uh, TPO and that uh, the ban was proportional in terms of uh, European uh, community uh, competition law, uh, which is to say it was an appropriate uh, manner of, of reaching the objective that question. It doesn't mean that it was perfect, but it was sufficient. Uh, in a nutshell, that's what happened uh, at the CAS. They went then to the Swiss Federal Tribunal, um, and uh, there at the Swiss Federal Tribunal, the Serang team trotted out the arguments about the non-independence or the alleged non-independence of the CAS. And, and the Swiss Federal Tribunal said, essentially, no, we've heard this before. The CAS is sufficiently independent. So that was the end of the normal uh, course of proceedings by Serang and Doyen. But what's special about their case, and similar to uh, Pechstein, is that they didn't stop there. They went back home to their own jurisdiction. They went to the Brussels courts, filed an action there. That action is still pending. Uh, it's that action which uh, triggered a court of appeals decision uh, a few weeks ago, which is why we're here talking about this topic this morning, because that Court of Appeals decision appeared uh, on its face, or at least the way it was uh, presented in the press, uh, it appeared to say that the system of consent in uh, sports uh, uh, arbitration uh, was um, invalid. Uh, because uh, under Belgian law, under Belgian law, and in fact under the New York Convention, and under many laws, you can submit to arbitration a specific legal relationship, or disputes arising under a specific legal relationship. But if, you, if your submission is so general that it might appeal, uh, apply to any uh, uh, relationship that you have with the counterparty, that might be suspect. Well, the FIFA and the standard uh, I would say sports arbitration uh, submission is very broad. What the Brussels Court of Appeals said was only that it was too broad for Belgian law purposes as far as that court understood it to be. That was read in some of the press reports that were uh, that came out immediately. Uh, that was read as uh, a casting a another cloud on the entire CAS um, system, but in fact, and, and on its structure, but in fact, it, it wasn't the case. 
the case is really focused on the drafting of the FIFA clause of arbitration, and, it, and if this decision is affirmed, and it may not be in Belgium, the only clear result would be uh, a, a requirement that FIFA narrow its clause. So th this, this particular case, uh, which in, in, in certain articles in, in, in Spanish uh, sports papers and, and, and others, uh, uh, this is a quote from the article in Us, I think. Uh, you know, the case puts in check the system of of, uh, of sports arbitration, or you know, the end of the CAS, or another Bosman. Well, uh, there was a lot of overstatement on this case. In, in, in my view, and we're we're running now short of time, uh, I can summarize by saying that the, another article that came out more recently indicated that the reports of the CAS's death <coughs> as a result of Serang are greatly exaggerated. So the Serang case, uh, for, for, for me, for now, is not a threat to the CAS. Uh, the Pakistan case and the underlying issues are a certain threat. And I'd like to close by mentioning just a couple aspects of possible, possible reforms that the CAS might want to consider, irrespective of what happens with these cases. In other words, uh, uh, along the lines of what ICSID is doing. And I, I don't have a slide for this, uh, uh, so uh, bear with me. But, but there are certain changes that, that the CAS, of course, might be required to impose if one or another of these courts yeah. requires them to do so. But there are changes that the CAS might want to make regardless, even if, as I hope and as I expect, the German Constitutional Court uh, and the European Court of Human Rights don't. Uh, give Claudia Pechstein any any greater uh, 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 leverage in, in their decisions, and even if, as I hope and expect, the Serene case really goes nowhere further. Some of the changes that might be considered. Uh, more parity uh, in the ICAST. We talked about the 20 members, 12 coming from federations, four being aligned with athletes. Well, uh, shouldn't that be more, more uh, parity-based? The question of should the CAS really name the presiding arbitrator in appeals cases, or shouldn't it be, uh, shouldn't the co-arbitrators, or, or parties through their co-arbitrators, be free to name uh, that chair, especially if, if the chair is someone on the closed list? Um, better disclosure of past cases that arbitrators have handled. Um, and, and whether in disciplinary cases, especially athletes uh, or sports executives should be entitled for their proceedings to be held in their own native language rather than in English or French, uh, which are the official languages of the CAS, and rarely and only with the consent of the CAS can other languages be used. Uh, there are other more radical changes that, that could be uh, considered or, or implemented, uh, including eliminating the, the closed list entirely. Um, or eliminating the possibility that the Secretary General uh, uh, advises or, or draws the attention of the tribunal to issues of substance in their draft awards. I think these last uh, changes are unnecessary and would probably uh, have some adverse, more adverse collateral uh, consequences than, than advantages. But, but still, uh, some changes uh, including the, the few that I mentioned uh, initially, might well be uh, considered. The, the, the CAS is strong um, and successful, but, but it doesn't live in a vacuum. Uh, legitimacy, and, and I conclude with this, uh, Inigo, uh, legitimacy and, and transparency are global issues in arbitration, uh, in investment arbitration, in consumer arbitration, and in sports arbitration, too. The ICSID uh, ongoing process of consultation with shareholders to publicly uh, review uh, uh, proposed rules uh, to deal with questions of diversity, technology, um, cybersecurity, third-party funding in a manner which is public uh, and involves in the involvement of stakeholders is a model that the CAS might want to consider uh, to be proactive, to continuously reinvent itself in order to remain. Uh, what it has become and, and what it aspires to continue to be, the Supreme Court of Sports Law. 
I think I'm out of time. I'll stop there, and if we have a chance for questions later. And a couple of questions in Espanol, también. Um, Please. Sorry, I actually did have one uh, one question about the list. Um, try, and, try and raise your voice. Yeah, sorry. Can you can you hear me? I can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is about about the the list the list of arbitrators. Um, and we know that the, the, the closed list is, is about 400, approximately 400, 400, exactly. yeah. 400 arbitrators. Mm -hmm. But in, in reality, it seems that there's, there's a much smaller pool uh, of arbitrators who are more active. Let, 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 let's just say that. Indeed. Um, and, and, and indeed, there are some who have probably never even um, had a case um, at the gas. Um, so do, do, in your opinion, do you think that um, f first of all, I'd like to know whether the ICAS has ever um, um, used its power to remove arbitrators or has this list only ever uh, kept increasing? And secondly, do you think that removing these kind of arbitrators, the ones who are more, who are, who are less active, do you think that um, it sort of is a threat to the independence of the CAS in terms of making the list more closed, if that makes sense? Uh, I I think it makes sense. I don't think, yes, the, the, the ICAS has removed people. I don't think they remove them because they're not active. Okay. I, I think they've removed them in rare um, exceptions because there may have been problems of one sort or another. But generally, uh, I think you're right. The list doesn't shrink. The list grows. And when the CAS wants to bring in people from outside, for example, outside the sporting world, uh, the list grows with some people from outside the sporting world when the CAS or the ICAS thinks it's appropriate to have more diversity, bring in younger people, bring in women. The list grows with those women and younger people. And then the issue is, that, as you say, how to uh, promote that those new people on the list uh, become, uh, get into the system and are actually named. And when those people come from the sporting world, well, uh, they are then known to the litigants, and, and they're likely to be named. When those people come from outside the sporting world, then they're just you know person number 400 on the list that nobody knows. So these people, it's very hard for these people to be named. The CAS tries to actually uh, get those people into the system, and, and this is what the CAS did in my own case, because I came to the CAS from outside the sporting world. It was so that parties wouldn't uh, appoint me. They, they, no reason for a party to appoint me. They didn't know me. But the cast knew me a little bit, wanted to get to know me better. So the cast began to appoint me uh, as a sole arbitrator in a small case, as arbitrator for a, a respondent party who had forgotten to name somebody, or a case in which there were two respondents and they couldn't agree. And that's a way of getting into the system. But it, it's not easy. Uh, the cast has a lot of balls in the air at the same time. And it's not easy uh, for them to uh, encourage uh, that the workload be, be shared among 400 arbitrators. That's an awfully big list. I've never, uh, I'm aware of some other arbitral institutions that have lists, uh, closed lists, but I'm, I'm not aware of any closed list as large as that one. And it's compounded by the fact that the parties choose their arbitrators uh, and often, yes, choose the people that they know the best, that are the most experienced, that are the best, uh, and, and there are many who are really good. Uh, and then the CAS, who's interested in the development of a solid body of, of, of jurisprudence. The CAS has an interest in having uh, solid, experienced people as chairs. So it, it becomes, uh, it becomes a, a jigsaw puzzle, and I mean, it's hard to put all the pieces together. Well, I'm afraid no, no more time for questions. Uh, thank you very much.